Sama Sambo Dasa Namo Tassa Vagavato Arato Sama Sambo Dasa Namo Tassa Vagavato Arato Sama Sambo Dasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One, we pay homage to him and to his Dhamma. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. So today, uh, what we're going to do is we are we're going to look at something that gets discussed. It comes up every once in a while. Let me come on back over here to the group for a second. Um, how do I do that? I can't remember. <laughs> Let's I'll see. end the uh, sharing. One second. Okay. So I want to say hi to everybody. How are you all doing? And we um, are going to take a look at a topic that comes up very often and, and look at it as clear as we can. I had another page to this. Just let me make sure I have both pages. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, it, and it pertains to um, people who say sometimes that when we're teaching TWIM, we're actually saying this is the only way to practice to get to Nirvana. And we're not really saying that. And the question is, is there only one way to get to Nirvana? And this, when we say, is there only one way to get to Nirvana, we have to look at what that really means, right? sentence itself does it mean there's only one way to practice to get there does it mean there's only one path there might be other paths and and this this uh question comes up because we look at how many of meditation and practices are going on today and when Monty Vimala Ramsey in 2006 he became the the uh, first ever uh, representative for the United States for the world's uh, largest Buddhist council with the Buddhist conference system, which was the uh, World Buddhist Council uh, out of Kato, Japan, where the location of the big temple was, the Royal Grand Hall of Buddhism. And all the Buddhist countries in Asia had come together to build this huge, huge place. But also, um, they had 40, about 40 different countries involved in this, and they wanted to bring the West into it. It was the first time there was an argument about this. Of course, should we let the Westerners come in, or should we keep them out, and this is our thing? And, and they decided to let the Westerners come in and started to collect, like France, Germany, Switzerland, all these different countries in Europe, and in different parts of the world, as well as the traditional Buddhist countries. They didn't keep people out, they won. Monty was elected into that system, the only one who was ever elected into that system, we say nominated into that system as a representative for his country by the peer monks. It doesn't have anything to do with the followers and lay people really who gets put in that position. It has to do with the highest monks in the world. So some people said, well, who put him there? <laughs> well, who put him there or nominated him there was actually K. Sri Dhammananda before he passed away, he nominated him. And Usulananda was the largest monk you can imagine in Burma for Pali scholar ever. And he was Bhante's teacher in the United States before, before Bhante went to Asia and kept track of him all through his development after his, he, he, when he took his higher ordination and was moving around in Asia. K. Sri passed away. Um, I, think, I don't remember the dates, but I lived through K. Sri passing away. I lived through Usulanida passing away. But there was a third person, Nandesina, Venerable Nandesina of Mexico, he was the one who got credit for the nomination because only one person could have it. And the older monks wanted Nandesina to have this honor. So Usulananda was interesting to me that 
it was interesting that Uslananda only ordained two people in his career. And one was my teacher, Bhante Vimal Ramsey. And the other person that was nominated was Nandesina to be trained to become a leader in Mexico. And here's Bhante. He's only ever nominated two uh, or ordained two people had anything to do with their ordination. The one is me that he he took me and took me and turned me into a seminary and uh, trained me himself as a, uh, as monks can do with female or male seminary or seminaras in the traditional way, everything that he was trained about. And so I, my training was long, arduous and very traditional, but at the same time, it was different because I wasn't exposed to the women's side of it because we were so into Dhamma, into practice, into development of meditation and building the center in the States. So he stayed with the organization in Japan until a few years ago. And when uh, they came asking him to come and just drop everything suddenly and just come to them because they decided to change their dates and everything was when he decided that's enough because um, they sometimes they they are very considered in very many things they did for the different leaders of the countries, but sometimes they're not very considerate. And this was something of breaking apart uh, the uh, the programs and everything that were set up for the people. And he decided that's enough, and he retired from it. Now he was a lifetime representative who followed. I do not know who followed. They asked us to help them, but we didn't know anybody who would qualify in the right ways uh, to meet the qualification demands. And then they did take someone else for the United States, neither here nor there right now. Okay. And that's still an organization which does function and attempts to claim to be the leaders of all Buddhism all three traditions in the whole world. It's interesting, <laughs> it's like that. But in the United States, when coming back to the practice in the United States, when Bonte took that position, I remember getting on the plane and flying back from Asia. And um, after the first big meeting we had with them on the nomination tour, when we went for two weeks to see what the whole thing was all about, and coming back, I did some evaluation for a few nights. I had a chance to do some research and there were something like 31 different schools of Buddhism in the United States functioning. And I realized, boy, this is tricky. How <laughs> can you communicate with everybody and all of them saying this way and that way and our way and your way and everything. And it was fascinating to me how Buddhism actually worked being an old Christian uh, in coming from uh, the uh, Episcopalian background, but also Protestant and Lutheran and Methodist and Baptist with my music and everything, learning about their systems, uh, the way that this was uh, being, you know, trying to shuffle and organize everyone, it was very complicated and didn't make uh we didn't have much contact with people as far as communicating about unification in Buddhism. It was interesting. Everybody has set ways they think about uh, in Buddhism, what is the objective or the main objective in, in the religion? If we said there was one program that was one objective, we would say for you to purify and retrain your brain uh, to change from reactions to responses, to be able to think clearly, focus better, uh, gain the full capacity of your brain eventually, if you were to really keep developing and developing and to experience what is called Nibbana. And Nibbana is the release of the tension and the tightness and the suffering that we go through when we are um, going through life. So we have the four noble, noble truths, you know they're framed for this. We have the four noble truths and in the four noble truths, there's, there is suffering, there is cause, there is cessation. And then there's a program of the Eightfold Path 
which gives us the way to live and to and to go all the way uh, to um, to nibbana by living and developing ourselves. Okay, uh, through following the eightfold path, these individual ways that people are practicing over time, and, th and this is all really normal. If you, you know, somebody said, how could it have fallen fractionalized so much? And how could it have so many ideas? This is right, that's wrong, all this stuff. How could that have happened? Well, you know, <laughs> it's 2,600 years is why. And, you know, if I had a recipe for my grandmother's Christmas cake and I could make her cake 20, 600 years ago, so it came out 12 inches high for the cake. That would be a wonderful thing. But 2,600 years later, unless we have the very precise ingredients, very precise recipe and instructions for blending and putting it together, that cake with one simple mistake of mixing all the eggs and egg whites together instead of separating them, for instance, might cause my cake to come out this high. So if we just talk about the cake recipe, when we talk about a meditation practice that was aimed at opening the mind and um, reaching, uh, reaching a, developing it so that we could see clearly how everything was working and learn how to question it as we're going along and test it and not believe it unless we actually um, see it for ourselves operating correctly. That's the way the Buddha was teaching. And um, what I'm trying to really get to here is it doesn't surprise me at all that it got so fractionalized and that anybody can invent this and start another tradition or not another tradition, but another school of Buddhism, even just next week. And nobody would say anything with the computer, with everything that's going on and everything. But what has happened is we have, um, we have fallen into a time when that is possible. And there's never been restrictions in Buddhism of like one person said to me, you know, there aren't any Buddha cops. I said, what do you mean? There's no such thing as a Buddha cop. Are you trying to be a Buddha cop? I said, no, I'm not trying to be a Buddha cop. I'm simply saying that TWIM, Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, has found a way to realize and experience the descriptions of the outcomes as they are described in the text. And to me, that, that's what's happened with what Bon TV Miller Ramsey uncovered. And so it's all a matter of attempting to see if you can practice something that operates clearly and you understand how it works. And if you keep doing it, the results start to come out to, to match what is described to you. And it fits together really well. Excuse me, I have to keep drinking water here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so over time, there were discussions about, definitely discussions about two components to the practice of meditation. And these two components are called serenity and insight. These two pieces have to do with the tranquil, tranquil part of your meditation and with the wisdom part of your uh, discovery, your wisdom discovery in the meditation. Now, today, it's pretty obvious that we divided these into two schools instead of two components. So because we have stepped away from the original text, we are not in touch with the fact that these things were actually working together instead of separated, really separated. But we come across one sutta that is often mentioned, it's called the tandem. I'm not sure. Let's go into the screen here and take a look now, okay, uh, of the, I think it gave the original, no, it doesn't give me the original name. <laughs> okay, I meant to write that down for you and I'm sorry, I don't think I did. Okay, 
But I'm going to read through this sutta, and this is not very long, but you'll see what happened is they felt uh, the, this is something uh, that needed to be discussed. And um, there were always debates about this, which one is right, this one, this direction, or that direction, or both directions, or what. So listen carefully to the sutta. This one is Dhanasara Bhikkhu's uh, translation. And there's not a lot that is different from Bhante's in this. There's only a couple little points, words that were chosen in translation, but it's not, it's mostly the same. So let's go through this. Okay. On one occasion, Venerable Ananda was staying in Kosambi at Gosita's monastery. And there he addressed the monks, friends. Yes, friend, the monks responded. Let's see if I can figure out how to move this. There we go. Venerable Ananda said, friends, whoever, monk or nun, declares the attainment of arahatship in my presence, they all do it by means of one or another of four paths. Which four? There is the case where a monk or a nun has developed insight preceded by tranquility. As he develops insight preceded by tranquility, the path is born. He follows that path, develops it, pursues it. As he follows the path, developing it and pursuing it, his fetters are abandoned, his obsessions destroyed. Then there is the case where a monk has developed tranquility preceded by insight. And as he develops tranquility preceded by insight, the path is born. He follows the path, develops it, Oh, am I reading the same one again? No, okay, I think this is right. Uh, he follows that path, develops it, pursues it. As he follows the path, developing it and pursuing it, his fetters are abandoned. His obsessions destroyed. Okay. So one of them is starting preceded with getting their tranquility basically set up. And then they're starting to do insight. The other one is attempting to do insight. Okay. Beef, and he is then moving on into deeper tranquility. Now let's look at the framework of this for just a minute. Cause I wrote this down. You, you need to kind of write this down as we do it, but okay. So the first one is what you're, what's happening here is path is born. The, from the moment it says path is born, they follow the path, they develop it, means they see it, they question it, and they, um, they test it. This is what they're doing in the training of the Buddha. Pursues it is meaning testing it out in life. So they're actually testing it, going out and testing it out in life. This is what they are doing. And the fetters are abandoned. So in all the cases, all these, there's four cases here. What's happening is then the obsessions, the obsessions mean the craving and the clinging are destroyed and are fading away by total uh, comprehension and abandonment is how they are destroyed. Now that's another topic to, you know, when we go into understanding hindrances where we really have to be sure we understand what the Buddha's intentions were about managing hindrances. There were a lot of other ideas going around and from what happened before he was a, a Buddha. And we wanna let go of those and attempt to test what it was he had as a solution, which was basically abandonment. So what happens here is, um, the Buddha, we have to remember that the Buddha grades us 
on the degree of our Dhamma comprehension and by the degree of our Dhamma application and functionality, not just by the Dhamma application in practice without an application in life and not just by understanding the tenets that have to do with the Dhamma itself, but not using it. That's what's important. He was teaching a parallel teaching. And when he left us a, a grading system for measuring our progress in his training, he left it set up with the two points involved, not just one, like how's your meditation going? How long did you sit? That sort of thing. He wanted to know your comprehension of the Dhamma and your degree of success in your meditation. The two measuring points appear in the Digha Nikaya, where the modes of progress are left for the monks to follow. We usually show you that in retreat. I usually show you a little diagram about that. So the third part of this, the third way of doing this, then there, there's the case where someone develops tranquility, okay, that's here, develops tranquility in tandem with insight. And that's like what we're doing with Twim, as he develops the tranquility in tandem with the insight, the path is born. And he follows um, the, this path and he develops it, pursues it. And as he follows the path, developing it and pursuing it, his fetters are abandoned, his obsessions are destroyed. So his craving and clinging stop, okay. Now then there is a case where uh, a monk's mind has its restlessness concerning the Dhamma. This means the corruptions of insight and corruptions, I don't know if I did that or not. Let me see if I... I have to check something here. The corruptions of um, insight, basically what keeps you from getting doing insight is you get caught in the hindrances. Basically that's what corruptions of insight are basically referring to. I'm trying to see one thing though about Bhikkhu Bodhi's um, and he didn't do it. I thought he did, but it may be another book I was thinking about. Okay. So when a person is caught in the corruptions of insight, what would the corruptions of insight be? What sensibly would that be? Would be you're caught in any of the 11 or 12 or 14 different types of hindrances that are occurring. And those you have to go through and you have to let them go. They have to all be dissolved and be abandoned completely. This is where it gets tough. It, it doesn't get too complicated. Uh, but if um, you're talking about it taking a whole very long time to reach path, a very long time to go down path and stuff like that, you are actually contrary to what the Buddha described and told you was possible. So what do I mean? Actually, when we talk about any of the services in all three traditions, it's very interesting. Very, all three traditions preserve sanatiko, akaliko, eipasiko, opanaiko, patitam, wiritabo, vinuiti. So what's talking about whatever he was teaching was easy to understand. Initially, it was easy to understand inviting deeper inspection. The more that you did it, you wanted to invite deeper. It invited you to come in and want more deeper, deeper inspection. In order for that to happen, my students tell me, if we like it and we're having fun doing it and we enjoy practicing and discovering things, then we do it more and more and we do go deeper and deeper. But if you're not, if it's not pleasant for you to practice and you don't like doing it, you don't keep doing it all the time. So there's practice of formal sitting, but there's also practice of applying it. And even in this sutta, we see it talking about uh, not just um, 
developing it, pursuing it, uh, but the application of it is really important. That's what's really, really very important. Applying it and testing it in life, pursuing it. That's what that meant, pursuing it beyond sitting on the pillow and to keep it going all the time. So you have to have something that functions all the time. So that's one of the things we all like about TWIM because the practice is universal. It goes across the line. It's applied to absolutely anything, everything that's going on in your life, all right? So the last one of these is there is a case where the monk's mind has its restlessness concerning the Dhamma well under control. It means that they figured out, they've gotten to the point where they have let, they are able to let go of the hindrances and just leave them alone, abandon them. They begin to understand the law of the hindrance and the law of the hindrances. It has no information for you. When the hindrance arises, the one thing you can see is you can learn how craving actually operates. That's one thing you can learn. And so in that sense, it's a teacher, but it doesn't hold any knowledge about how to reach Nibbana, how to get attainments and stuff like that. So there's no reason to concentrate really hard on an object. This is something that we had uh, some discussions about what is the actual reason for having a, um, a, an object of meditation in a meditation in the first place. And the reason is if you're pulled away, then you have a place to come back to and continue to sit. If we didn't have an object of meditation, we wouldn't be able to sit for very long periods of time. Or if we kept sitting, we just our mind would just be floating around like this without any real observation that was fulfilling the understanding of the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape of the phenomena that keeps arising and passing away. And you want to understand that. Then it says, there comes a time when his mind grows steady inwardly. It settles down and becomes unified and concentrated. Now, unified and concentrated question whether it's there and need to go to a poly scholar to find it but unified unified in purpose is fine unified in concentration in a one-pointed way is not fine concentrated is fine as long as you understand it means the correct tone and degree of concentration this is where we would say it becomes collected perfectly in perfect collectedness of mind. The reason Bundy chose collectedness of mind, and there was a teacher before him who did that too. He wasn't the first one, but collectedness of mind meant you bring, gather it together so that you're able to watch forward and continue to observe, but you're not bringing it so far together that you can't see anything as it's happening anymore. In him, the path is born, and he follows that path, develops it, pursues it. And as he follows the path, developing it and pursuing it, his fetters are abandoned and his obsessions are destroyed. So when the conditions become right, no matter which way that you go into this, always when the path actually is born, the path happens when the tranquility and the, um, the uh, serenity and the insight are yoked evenly together. That's the only time the path is actually born, okay? So it doesn't matter if you were to start by attempting the tranquility, the tranquility, the systematic way was the tranquility practice or serenity practice was to calm the person down very quickly and then training them about what it is insight is and what it is and uh, how, what it is you're trying to see, what are you trying to watch? So I wanna, whoever this monk or nun declares the attainment of our hotship and uh, whenever that happens um, in my presence, they all do it by means of one or another of these four paths. So these are four, approaches into the meditation. But when the path actually 
happens, okay, comes into, into focus where you start going down the jhanas, then there's only one path and there's only one cessation point and there's only one coming out and experiencing Nibbana. That's what there's only one. This is what we need to understand. Okay, so this was this uh, discussion. It doesn't um, declare like a uh, twim is wrong or right or this is right or wrong or anything else like that. It's just basically discussing the situation where a person started. But in the end, when we look very carefully at it, um, and then we begin to see how do we get this back, Bonte? <laughs> Can you give it, help me get a um, Just one full of people? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, we just, it's, it's, some people would say, I like the story about 42 different kinds of objects of meditation, or 40 different, I'm sorry, 42 different meditations. That's one of the slippages that's occurred. A slippage is where actually it meant 42 different, uh, they were talking about 42 different objects of meditation. So if we go to all the texts to look up what they were talking about, we would find 42 different objects of meditation being used. Uh, but the same uh, actual meditation is being performed. Okay. So there weren't 40 two different kinds of meditation. There were 42 objects that you could have used in order to start out to get into the meditation, but the observation, all the rest of it is the same. And in fact, when when a long time ago, Bhante and I, we spent some time to see how many we could find and he found 51. And I went in and said, that's right, it's not 42, it's 51. But it's 50, 51 objects, it makes no difference what you used as an object if you understand what the object's for. This is what's important, understanding how to use an object and what it's for. So now I wanna take, I wanna ask you if you have any questions at this time, any questions on uh, this, at this point, <laughs> at this point, anybody wanna say anything about this? And then we have another little sutta we can look at in conjunction with this. Anybody have any questions about it? Okay. Okay, now when we go into 149, this is the great sixfold base, the Maha Saliatanaka Sutta. And in here, basically, there's a declaration in section 10 that is trying to make it clear. That the fulfillment of the 37 requisites of enlightenment and the whole program can only happen when these two things, serenity and insight, would be tranquility and insight if it, if he was saying instead he would Tanisara would say tranquility we say serenity. It occurs in him yoked evenly together. And by pointing this out here in in this place, what we're seeing is that the path itself it's coming up because you're applying the two pieces correctly together. And then you get the conditions right quickly when you're doing it with the third application in the, in, when you're looking at the four of them in the third application. So if you're developing them side by side, they'll come out like that. So we listen to this sutta from the beginning, it's really kind of nice. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living at Sawati in Jetis Grove, Anathapindikas Park. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied, and the blessed one said this, I shall teach you the discourse on the great sixfold base, 
listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir. The vicars replied and the blessed one said this. Just one moment, okay? Are you coming back at what time? I'm only here. I'm sorry, what? I'm only here. Okay, good. Good deal. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I had to check in with my medical advisor. I can continue now. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> so when one does not know and see the eye as it actually is, when one does not know and see forms as they actually are, when one does not know and see eye consciousness as it actually is, when one does not know and see eye contact as it actually is, when one does not know and see as it actually is the feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition, then one is inflamed by lust for the eye, for forms, for eye consciousness, for eye contact, for feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition. You are open for trouble. If you un don't understand how everything is operating, then you can fall into the lust and fall into the desire and fall into taking things personally. When we, when we shake down everything to the smallest part, we find out that the, the thing that frees us the most is knowledge and vision, but it's also experimenting with not taking things so seriously and letting go of taking everything personally as if it is me, it is mine, and it is myself. When, if one were to imbide and abide inflamed by lust and fettered and infatuated, contemplating gratification in personal involvement, that the five, then the five acres, when affected by the clinging, are built up for oneself in the future and it, and it produces an energy. And when we talk about the energy of how is it that's the wheel of samsara, why is it a wheel? And if it is a wheel, why, how does it get turned? What makes it turn? Where does the energy come from? It starts with the opinion, I like this, and then I want this, and then all the reasons and stories about why you want it, and, and you like it, and you want it, and then where you try to go forward and try to get it, and that that sort of thing. And that's a building up of the power of it. And then the birth of action to try to get it and hold on to it, you see, and try to hold it and make it permanent. That's a problem. It's a problem. When one does not know and see um, these things as it actually is, they get into trouble. And it goes through this for each of the six sense doors. When one does not, uh, this lust and the fettered means you're caught by it, infatuated, you are fascinated by it, contemplating the gratification, the personal involvement of it. How can I make it mine and that sort of thing? All the personal side. That's the danger in the Atta, the danger in the Atta, uh, the Atta uh, perspective of assuming everything is about me, it is mine, it is myself. This is what leads us to the suffering of believing everything is happening to us. And we, it, without knowledge, uh, we cannot get free. We cannot get free. And we cannot change unless we clearly understand how this is happening, which is why we try to show you on the seven links in dependent origination that come from where contact happens. We contact as condition, a feeling arises. We feeling as condition, craving arises. And that's where the personal I enters in with craving as condition, clinging arises. The story about why I like it, why I want it, all running around in our heads. 
all from the past coming in, pouring in over us. And we don't are unable to let go of the past. We are unable to let go of the future. We cannot seem to exist very well at all in the present time, one thing at a time during the day. So this is what we practice experiencing when we come to retreat. And then we talk about the ear in the same way. We talk about the nose, the tongue, and the body in the same way. And then we go to the mind. This was one of the genius discoveries of the Buddhist was to see that the mind, it is actually operating the same exact way. We can be sitting on a, a couch and innocently doing something and a thought comes up. And the process of contact with a mind object happens. And when that happens, with that contact as condition, a painful feeling might arise from a memory of something that was sorrowful or hurt us or depression. It was depressing in some way. And when we have that happen, it feels like it happened to us, but it actually happened from us what we first have to learn the knowledge of how it works precisely. Then we have a chance of fixing this. Now we go to section nine, when one knows and sees that eye as it actually is, when one knows and sees the forms as they actually are, when one knows and sees the eye consciousness as it actually is, when one knows and sees eyes contact as it actually is, when one knows and sees as it actually is, the feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. That arises with the eye contact as condition. And then one is not inflamed by lust for the eye, for those forms, the eye consciousness, the eye contact, the eye feeling, or which is felt as uh, pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with the eye contact as condition. So it's a bit of training, a bit of knowledge of precisely how this works. Then we can fix it. But remember when you were riding your bike and you got a flat tire one time when you were young, you were so embarrassed you didn't want to tell your dad or your mom or anything and nobody told you how to fix the tire. Probably that was the time maybe your dad or your mom or somebody showed you maybe how to fix the tire, but you couldn't fix the bike, could you, until you understood how the tire broke and how to fix the wheel, see? This is the same thing. So it isn't something to be afraid of or worried about or depressed about. This is something, it's a matter of precisely understanding the operations of this and how it's all happening. But when one abides uninflamed by the lust, unfettered, uninfatuated, co contemplating the danger clearly, then the five aggregates, when they're affected by clinging, are, are diminished for oneself in the future. They're smaller and less and less. And the one's craving, which brings renewal of being, is accompanied by delight and lust and delights in this or that is abandoned. You're delighted in the fact that you understand it is what you get to keep. And mental torment, I'm sorry, one's bodily and mental troubles, they are abandoned. You start letting things go. One's bodily and mental torments are abandoned. One's bodily and mental fevers are abandoned. And one's experience, uh, is, one experiences bodily and mental pleasure. Mm. Now listen, before I do this paragraph, let me tell you what I was doing. Yesterday I went out and I was thinking about this talk and I was sitting over, there's a playground where I can sit and I can watch them all. I can actually see them from the deck on this apartment has a deck on the side of it. I can, I can actually watch them from there, but getting closer on a hillside, sitting on a bench is kind of fun looking down on this area, this playground. Four or five women came over and they sat down with their children, turned the little children loose in the playground. On one side, there's a pole that you can climb up the pole and down again. There's another rope where you can try to walk up a rope by holding two ropes 
to get up to the top where the sliding board is. There's a place at the top where there's a platform you can sit and make a decision if you want to slide down the 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 uh, the sliding board or not. <laughs> so I was facing the children, but I could hear the women talking from where I was sitting. I wasn't eavesdropping, but it was real interesting. They were talking kind of loud. And I don't know Polish, but I could figure out what was basically going on by watching their expressions. And you could tell that, you know, the exchange here was an exchange about what was going on. And this past was, past was this morning, earlier today. Did you know I heard this and I heard that? And you can imagine, you know, and then the other one is say, oh, yes, but mm -hmm, yes, and I know, and that, and this and that coming about the past. But then another one was piping up and I caught a few words that meant she was talking basically about the future. And then they were narrowing in and just continuing to do this sort of thing in the present time. And their minds were busy, 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 no, no, no calm, no peace of mind. And it was after a rainstorm. It was very pleasant out there. It was very nice. It wasn't too wet to play in the playground. It was just right and it was cool. It was very nice. Then I watched the children. When I succeed to watch the children, I could notice something. I was watching very carefully how they were climbing the pole. And when they were finished climbing the pole with concentration on the pole, and getting to the bottom, they were taking over to the rope to go up the other exercise to get to the platform where the where the uh, sliding board was. And that's all they were doing. And then when they got to the top of the platform, they were pausing and they were making a decision whether they would slide down the sliding board or not to the bottom. What was interesting was how come they looked so relaxed? They were playing so pleasantly, which isn't unusual around here. Everybody's playing pretty nicely. But their faces were really relaxed. And when they were doing one thing at a time, they were working in the, it was obvious they, they were in the, the little road of, if you draw a picture, they were inside here in the present time, just here. But what was interesting was I didn't notice anything pressing, pressing, pressing with a pressure here or pressing, pressing, pressing with a pressure here, like I did when I watched the women communicate. So what was different all of a sudden hit me when they come to the playground, they're not full. But when we go to the playground, we're full. So we have pressure pushing here and pressure pushing here. And if we don't understand how this actually works, if we don't learn the lesson very clearly from Bada Karata Sutta, the 131 is the one where it's telling you that early lesson I mentioned to you so many times. With the with the little um, the little thing that is um, oh let's see it's a little piece of prose in the front of that lesson and it keeps repeating itself again and again let not a person revive the past or on the future hold his hopes build his hopes for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Each, instead, let, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that state and be sure of it, invincibly and unshakably. Now, the reason those two phrases are so important is that's what you're doing when you're practicing and that's what you're learning to see. You are learning to see each arising state, how it actually works. It's not that you're going to watch state, 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 not like that, but you're learning the mechanics of how this works, you see. 
And every time you, you see it, you want to understand it invincibly, unshakably in your mind. It operates the same way every single time in the whole entire universe. Not even our galaxy, but the whole universe and beyond our universe to other universes. You're talking about Anicca. It's absolute. And when the past is past, we don't let it go. Historically, our societal structure, our species holds on to that. We can hold on to the lessons and hold on to that part, but we don't have to hold on to the bulk of it. And we, we hold on to so much that is unessential not essential to what we're doing today, not helpful to us what we're doing today either. That's our mistake. We only need to be going one day at a time. You know, I remember my, my sister-in-law when she died, she only wanted one song sung. And it was a Christian song about one day at a time. That's all she wanted was just one day at a time. And she had taken her last, period of time with people in a remarkable way. I had that year she died. I had the opportunity to be with my brother-in-law who died one way and um, my sister-in-law who died the total complete opposite way. And then some other members of my family who just instantly went, instantly in their sleep without any period going on with any conversation or much to talk about, about how the person was leaving. It was very, very easy, very easy leaving. But the two of them were so completely opposite. In the one case, the person was pushing to be waited on hand and foot until the day he died and not a giving up until the end when I visited him and he just fessed up to me, meaning he told me everything. And he really saw his mistakes and in the end said how very sorry he was to everybody, but he was very angry. And we knew he was very angry. He wasn't that old when he left. But in Sandra's case, it was so different. In Sandra's case, she was so highly involved not necessarily Buddhist involved, Christian evolved, clear with her maker or with her Lord and her own faith, very clear that way about that and very accepting. But the most beautiful thing of all was if you went to see her, to visit her, we watched her go from 160 pounds to about 62 pounds when she passed away lying in bed and unable to get up all that time. And when we went to visit her, the only thing she wanted to know was how are the children doing? And how is your husband? And what's new with the horses? And what's happening with the dogs? And what's happening at the farm? And what's happening at work? And there was no space for how are you doing? We would, of course, say it when we came in the room, but she barely I'm here and this is happening and let's find out how are you. She was giving, 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 giving to the very end. It was so beautiful. It was so incredible the way she did this. And it was not that at nighttime alone that she was breaking down either. Her children were there with her and they were all together and we had counseling time to work with her children, um, you know, and and uh, help them to support each other with other children. Because at that time, American Cancer Society had, had a partner to hang out with. If you were the husband, you had other husbands to talk to. If you were the wife of the person who was ill, you had other wives to talk to. Uh, but if you were children, you were left in the other room. And we said to them, why is this happening? Children really can help each other and started a children's movement in that program. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Penelope Sally, she was working on her PhD in psychology and was heading up that program in Virginia. 
it was wonderful and and got it so the children had support but these children knew one thing they were so happy with their mom even though they knew they would miss her they had learned one great great thing that if you give to others you will be supported and helped yourself if you are working for the good of people and and helping them to see more clearly then you know and communicating you will get back the love and, and the support that you need. And she did. It was a beautiful thing to witness. Coming back to this sutta, it goes into section 10, the Maha Salyatanika Sutta, and is where it mentions at the bottom that the serenity and insight in the case of the meditation can only come to happen by it only occur in him yoked evenly together. And so for the path to form, it has to come. It doesn't matter if you start here and then go here and then reach here. By the time you get here to form path, it has to be like that. So it's basically saying it has to be like that to be path. So the way Twim is doing this is basically following the third part. And you're all going the same place. So what does it matter? But the thing is, you want to be able to let go, relax, smile, step back, watch. You want to be a watcher. You do not want to be a controller, a doer. You want to notice a few things. How does craving work? How does craving arise? How does clinging change things? When the mental proliferation comes in the mind about why you like or don't like something, you feel the tightness increase. That is the craving and the clinging. That is the forceful part. That's pushing the wheel. And if you let go of that, each time you let go of that, you're telling the brain, let go, relax, smile, and this is going to be fine. It'll all work out. Yeah? And that's what we're looking at with this whole thing. So let me read you this. The view of the person, such as this, uh, as this is right view, a person, his intention is right intention, his effort is right effort, his mindfulness is right mindfulness. Remember, mindfulness is your observations operating correctly. His effort was the letting go, relax, smile, come back, the four steps of right effort. His Mindfulness is right mindfulness. The concentration is right concentration, meaning it's balanced. It's a profitable concentration. What would profitable concentration mean? Profitable means it's going to turn into path. It's the right, the right uh, blend for it to turn into path. But his bodily action, his verbal action, and his livelihood have already been purified earlier. We don't agree with that. <laughs> And that's just something you have to figure out for yourself. Um, this is something that was brought up, but isn't in the text itself. It wasn't dissected that way. It was later dissected that way. But one of the things I said about the path is why is it a fold? Why is it an eightfold path? Why not an eight step path or an eight part path? Why eight folds? Take a piece of paper and fold it so there's eight. Uh, folds in it and and you can cool yourself off with it like this if you fold it properly but if you take it and you fold it so there's only uh five or four or only three because you eliminate certain parts of it you can't fold you can't cool yourself anymore and you need all eight of them working simultaneously together in order for this to happen the right way where the path can protect you properly um, from the invasion by the hindrances, but also it can support the functionality of the meditation. We come, the Eightfold Path comes to fulfillment in him by development. That's development of the whole thing, applying it. You would be so surprised if you knew how many people have said, oh, this is good. The retreat's over. Now I can go home and have a cup of wine. <laughs> 
or I can come, I can go home now and I can break the precepts a different way. I can go back to where I was before I was at the retreat. Retreats are not for that. They're not for that at all. The retreats are for your deep work so you can take it home and keep it going all the time. When um, he develops the Eightfold Path, the four foundations of mindfulness also come to fulfillment in him by development. You've realized that, that body, feeling, mind, and dhammas are not me, are not mine, are not myself. In a nutshell, this is what fulfillment of this means. And four right kinds of striving uh, are also come to fulfillment. That's your right effort when it turns into automatic. And that happens through continual development of right effort and the brain will just all of a sudden switch and start doing it automatically. Four bases for spiritual power also come to fulfillment in him by development. And the five faculties also come to uh, into fulfillment by him by development. And the five powers um, also come uh, into fulfillment by him by development. The five powers are the five faculties when they turned automatic. The Seven enlightenment factors also come to fulfillment in him by development. And these two things, serenity and insight, occur in him yoked evenly together. It has to be that way for path to actually happen and be set for you to follow. And he fully understands by direct knowledge those things that should be fully understood by direct knowledge. And he abandons by direct knowledge anything that should be abandoned by direct knowledge. And he develops by direct knowledge the things that should be developed by direct knowledge and realizes by direct knowledge those things that should be realized by direct knowledge. And direct knowledge, and we have always said direct knowledge and um, knowledge and vision are very close to the same thing. Saying when you direct knowledge means it's knowledge you've gotten directly through seeing it. That's how it, it works in his training. And what things uh, should be fully understood. And then he tells you the answer to that is the five aggregates affected uh, by clinging, you know them. And that this, the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the per perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, but it means holding on and building more and more thoughts and stories about around the clinging, holding on. That is what it means. And the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. These are the things that should be fully understood by direct knowledge, by doing it and experiencing it and repeating it again and again and again. And then what should be abandoned? Ignorance and craving for being, for in in day to day living, ignorance and craving for reacting, continuing to react, react, react. Okay, in ignorance and craving in reference to life to life, pushing the consciousness forward, the energy that pushes it forward from one life into another life. And these are the things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge. And what things should be developed by direct knowledge? The serenity and insight. And these are the things that should be developed by the direct knowledge, by practicing again and again and practicing systematically. So you just remember whenever you feel a feeling arising, it shouldn't be surprising. It's how this whole uh, body operates. And whenever the feeling's arising, you just let it go, let it go, let it go. And this experiential learning, this part here of learning how it all works, that's what stops the wheel of samsara from turning, you see? So whenever the feeling's arising, let it be, just leave it be, leave it be. And you just simply, these are things that are pulling you away from what you're trying to do during the day. But when you get up and go through the day, relax into the day and do one thing at a time. 
just the way Sandra wanted that song for everybody to remember to do one thing at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking of you. And that's the song she wanted. That's what she wanted. That's what she had lived by. Sandra was remarkable because she never finished high school and she decided to bring money into the family to help with our two girls to go to community college. And she took care of babies for people after they were born. She took care of them as a, a nursery thing. And as soon as they were old enough to go to the um, first uh, you know, daycare type center or the first old enough to go to, um, uh, mm, she only kept them five babies in the house, <laughs> it's really fun because we could always go over and play with the babies. Go over and play with the babies, five babies and taking care of them and mothering them while the women were beginning to go back to work after they had the babies. And then as soon as they could go to a nursery school, the earliest form of the nursery school, then she would turn over to another child. She would not keep taking them care of, take care of them further in daycare. She only took care of those little newborn babies, the, the babies that were born so mom could get back if they had to get back to work. And so this is the story about how this works and what things should be realized by direct knowledge is true knowledge and deliverance. And these are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. And when one knows and sees the sixth sense door in this way, these things, uh, the sixth sense basis, then these things should be realized by direct knowledge. And that's how it works. And when one sees um, each one of these sense doors, this is how it works all the way to the end of the sutta, um, all the way to the mind. And this is what the blessed one said and the monks were satisfied and delighted in the blessed one's words. And that one I wanted to hook on to the other one because it was a good sutta in very simple in explaining. So I hope this answers some of the questions we had come about the different ways that we can start out in our practice and but that we're all getting to the same path we're moving towards to go down and go through uh, the jhana experience in the way that we're training you. And you see it clear more clearly now. Does anybody have any questions? You know, Bonte, I just listened to an old talk by Bonte, and he said, you know, I get really upset if nobody has any questions. The Buddha used to get really upset. <laughs> he would come out, he would sit down, he would explain something, and, and, and then he would, he would wait for somebody to ask a question, and then he would go away in the story and go uh, to sleep because nobody said anything. And the monks would sit there like this, and they would think for a few minutes after he left. And then they'd say, you know, we really should go to, to find one of the elder monks and ask them what he meant. <laughs> and then they would go away and find an older monk to come back and explain it. And he would start out by, by scolding them because why? because here's the teacher, get the answers. <laughs> That's what we train for giving you the answers. So if you have any questions you need to ask, <laughs> okay. So we're all clear. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sindhu. Hi. How are you? Do you have a question? Yes, sister. I have a question regarding my practice. Uh, when in day-to-day -day life, uh, when you are facing a problem or when you are suffering or some kind of emotional suffering, you are, I am, when I am able to identify it, I know what uh, that I had an attachment, but at that moment, I was unable to let go of that and be in loving kindness. I was able to smile, but I was not able to radiate loving kindness. Okay, so when something like that happens, 
it's not just let go and put the loving kindness in. First, you have to really let go, relax your head, let go and relax your mind, and then smile at it, okay? And you bring up loving kindness to try to put into the situation, okay? It's not always going to work 100%, but it's a process of a, of a cycle, you see? And, and what you're really dealing with when something emotionally upsets you also is it's like forgiveness, compassion, and loving kindness. And I don't have my little pen, so I can't do this. But if you put on a piece of paper when somebody, when somebody upsets me, okay, first, I have to forgive whatever this is on the spot. Just forgive it in your mind. Then... Use, use compassion. Remember what we said about compassion. Compassion means, first of all, you're seeing another person in pain and you uh, know the pain is their pain and you love them unconditionally anyway. So you give them space to have their pain and you love them unconditionally. So that means you cannot fix the other person or change what they do. You, you remember that part. You can only fix yourself. You can only change what it is for yourself. So if something, it feels like something's happening to you in a situation, actually it's happening from you because it's your decision. If you're going to take what is happening personally, and like it's happening to me, or are you going to take the situation as if the person is, whatever they're saying to you, if it hurts your feelings, is really they're talking about themselves. It's, they're not talking about you. You know, when somebody gets upset with you or they yell at you, we don't like that and we get very hurt by it and we get very defensive. We wanna defend ourselves. That's because we're letting it happen to us. But the truth is when somebody is coming down on you, they are angry at themselves for letting it get to this point, or they are angry at themselves. They're talking about themselves, not you at all. So you let it, you know how we say, let it go over you like it, like water goes over a duck's feathers. It the, just, the water just goes, oh, you know, it just goes over you. So you don't take it as if it's coming at you. Let it come to you and go around you and just go past you. Do you understand? Yeah. And there's there's one. OK, let me try this. There there was a lesson the Buddha gave Rahula. And he said, I want you to always meditate like the elements meditate like water or fire or um, the earth or the air. So let's take for just a minute water. So when something is coming at you, uh, when you when you look at water coming down a stream, down a mountain, it comes down and when it gets to a rock, you know, like, let's see, I need a rock. Here is a rock when it comes down and to the mountain and it comes to this rock. When it gets to this rock, it instead of hitting it and pushing down the rock, it, it can it goes around it, doesn't it? The water goes around it. You see? You are the rock. You are the rock, and you let things just come past you. And you just you just smile like you're smiling now. You forgive it. This is your part is you forgive it. You use compassion to have, let the person have the space they need to, to whatever it is that they're doing. Okay. Let them have that space, but then you forgive them. You let them have that space. And then loving kindness is something we wish for that person to feel better. We wish that person we forgave them. We gave them compassion to have space. Now we wish for them to feel better. We wish for them to be happy. That's all it is. You don't have to have a big gushing feeling of loving kindness, you know? I mean, I got in a taxi the other day. Now, let me tell you, I can't get, it's hard for me to, I, I can, but it's hard for me to get in and out of cars. So my medical support person who's with me all the time, he 
I grab his hand and he lowers me into the car in the front seat. Now with all the cabs around here, they know about me. <laughs> I have a big, you know, hat on and a sun hat. They know that I have my walking stick. I have to get in the cab. They open the door, push the seat back, and they let me lower me in. So this cabbie, he didn't know about me. And uh, he's, oh, you can't sit in that seat. Oh, no, 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 you can't sit in that seat. You have to sit in the back. I think he was a new driver. I think he thought that nobody could sit in the front seat. And I just looked at him and I started laughing and I said, but you know, I have to, I have to. And then he let me sit down and I kept smiling at him. And then he helped me put my, my strap on. He said, well, it's okay. I said, it's okay, I'm gonna get out soon. And then he started laughing. <laughs> he said, yeah, it's a cab. You get in, you get out. <laughs> I said, so I'm only going to be here a minute. It's only two blocks from here to the to the hospital. Yeah, it's no big deal. <laughs> so I'm laughing at him and we're he's driving and we're laughing and my medical assistants in the back trying. He said, I couldn't believe how you two were having so much fun and he doesn't speak English and you don't speak Polish. <laughs> Neither. But he understood what I was trying to say. And you just have fun with people. There's no reason to, to get, you know, up uptight about people, you know. You see? No, really. And it's up to you. You're in charge of what goes on for you inside, right? You cannot change the other person. Yeah? People can be really mean, you know? But if you smile back at them, they are really feeling ashamed right now <laughs> that they should not have, uh, you know, they should not uh, have uh, been mean to this this um, little old lady. <laughs> and I don't seem like such a little old lady, but but I'm pretty funny right now because I'm not as strong as I should be. I'm strong enough, but I'm not real strong right now. You see. So you just let it go by. This is the thing. Look at the water came down the stream and hit you. But he, he, he hit you. But you just let it go around you and keep going. You don't let it bother you. You need to remember Dr. Ambikar, he never let it get to him, did he? <laughs> Baba Sahib, he never let it get to him, did he? When you read the stories about all the things that happened to him, he never got angry back at the people. So many things happened to him. So what he was doing was he was practicing, okay, let it go by, that's all. And then it's over. No need to talk about it, it's over. It's past, it's done. You see, don't hold on to anything. You see, okay, that's how you practice, okay? Yeah? You just keep smiling, okay? And you help other people smile. They can't, they can't stay upset if you smile right back at them. They really cannot, okay? Anybody else? Okay, Bonte, are you there? Yeah? Yes. <laughs> so do you have any questions, Bonte? <laughs> uh, no questions. I don't know. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> okay. I just, uh, just wanted to uh, kind of uh, remind everybody, next week uh, you would be in a retreat. Uh, so yeah. I will take the next week class. So, uh, But yeah. Sunday, I'm free on Sunday. Uh, 21st. What day you're traveling on Sunday or Monday? We'll be there the day early. We'll be there the day early. And, okay. and so I'm not sure what time that's working that we'll get there, but I think 
on, on Sunday, right? It's Sunday. The 11th, it's, it's, yeah, Sunday at 11 o'clock. I'm going to have to, uh, okay, I will check with Aaron on that because I'm not sure the, I'm not sure the transportation will be there yet. I don't know what time of day it's happening. Okay. Okay, so I'll check with him and I'll tell you for sure. Okay. And is that Ardika at the bottom? Is that who that is? Or Avinash. Uh, Avinash? <laughs> I'm forgetting people. <laughs> I don't remember everybody. You know, if you go to um, to uh, Yoshina's class with like 150 people, she won't let you put a placeholder. You know about that? <laughs> you have to show your face. I, I don't know. Maybe pretty soon I'll have to do that. So everybody says hello. Because, <laughs> yeah, because um, because the, everybody will say hi. Hi, let's see Avinash there. Hi. Hi, and, hi, uh, hi sister. How are you? Are you okay? I'm I'm good, sister. How how are you, sister? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I've been happy the last few days. I've been able to eat and rest and walk and sleep, and that's pretty good. <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty good. You keep smiling and remember to give your smiles away. That is the most important part of what we have to do each day, okay? All yeah. right, let's say a prayer and we'll let this go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.